Hello and welcome, you feeble-minded consumers. I'm Philip Magnus and I'm back after a three-month hiatus, during which I enjoyed my summer so much more than I would have if I was locked inside this room doing YouTube videos forever. YouTube videos that no one will ever see, in fact. It is a Sisyphean task and it is, I suspect, my punishment. But I did get a little bit of reprieve in the summer of 20. 21. And the purpose of this video, in fact, is to catch you up with all the books I read during that summer. Were there plenty of them? Perhaps. Depends on whom you're asking. If you're a book blogger, perhaps you will laugh at the small, tiny amount of books that I have read during the last few months. Or perhaps you will be in awe of me if you are one of those people who never pick up a book, but then again, if you are, you probably are not watching this video, so let us get on with it. What did I read in this summer, the never-ending summer of 2020, 2021? At least it feels that way. First off, we're going to be doing literary and contemporary fiction. Cue the cue card. <clears throat> Thank you. First off, my friends, I have read a number of really good pieces of either contemporary or literary fiction. Perhaps my favourite of them all has to be Rachel Cusk's Second Place, a novel which tells of a novelist's invitation to a great, in her opinion, artist, an artist she feels very much uh, compelled by and connected with. Unfortunately, when this artist arrives to her, shall we call it, summer house, it's not really her summer house, but it is treated as such by her many guests. As soon as he arrives, the expected connection that our unnamed protagonist has sought, well, it doesn't materialize. What's worse, there are quite a few moments of, of tragedy that strike, some of them um, elaborately crafted by the artist, others completely natural and unforeseen, which turn the life of our protagonist very much fragmentary. And, and confusing, which turn around some of her preconceptions. It is a an enjoyable novel, is, is the least um, powerful way in which I can describe it. Second Place is one of those works that, that really resonated with me, not just chapter by chapter, but as I read each page, each paragraph, I found that Rachel Cusk was delivering truths that resonated with me on a deep level. It's cool, isn't it? To, to find a novel, and a uh, non-fantasy one at that, which simply speaks to you on a level that literature rarely seems capable of doing. And that's saying something, because literature, to me, is, is the genre that, uh, or rather, the, the art that speaks to me most. It is on the long list for the Booker Prize for this year, and I would say a very, very well-earned spot that. I'm a big fan of Rachel Cusk. I have read her... Outline Trilogy. I have even written about it in an um, academic setting. And I have to say, I, I honestly think that Rachel Cusk is the foremost literary author of Great Britain right now. One of them, certainly. I don't read that many literary authors as of yet. Contemporary ones, I mean. So I, I'm not sure how many have have the skills, the technique, the the um, foresight to compare with her, but I know for a fact that she is 
someone someone worth reading if you enjoy interesting writing which is attempting to do more with with the form of literature than has been done before it is at the same time this novel second place a play on uh some some history with D. H. Lawrence, which you can definitely read more about, if you'd like. My my memory of it is not very clear because it was the very first novel I I read over the summer, but I have to tell you, it left in me impressions like few other books have in recent times. If you'd like me to, to talk about it more, to go and refresh my memory of Second Place and to perhaps do an actual review of that book, why don't you let me know in the comments down below and don't forget to press the like button, let's move on. And we will do so with three novels by Haruki Murakami, which I read in in uh, a wave of... of Thirst for the Japanese author's craft. Haruki Murakami is one of my absolute favorite authors. No question about that. I think that he is perhaps literature's foremost expert on loneliness, on, on writing about individuals who feel outside of a society that Japanese society, as you might imagine, very much expects that you will, to some point at least, uh, abandon a certain degree of individuality for, for the collective. And not every individual is ready to do so. These individuals are the bread and butter of Haruki Murakami's work, most commonly. The first work I read was South of the Border and West of the Sun. Very short, I think I went over it in a day and a half. It is about um, post-Second uh, World War, uh, the post-Second World War generation, about uh, an only child during a time when only children were something of a rarity in Japan. And that was the first point during which this this um, character felt isolated. It is very much a typical Bildungsroman, uh, a novel of uh, development, which follows and in some way mirrors uh, common themes in Haruki Murakami's um, fiction and, as I said, mirrors parts of his life. Murakami himself was an owner of a jazz bar he he himself, I suspect, always felt a certain level of isolation from his his uh, compatriots and and the folks he he lived in he lived with during his early years, and all of that shows um, common topics in in Murakami's fiction. Uh, involve cats, they involve um, people who might or might not own jazz bars or work at jazz bars, a love for classical and um, jazz music, very commonly um, West European and American culture. Now, South of the Border and West of the Sun is in some ways a love story and in other ways a story of of familial, of marriage life, and of the difficulties of being true to another person. I suspect that one of the greatest lessons I learned from that book was just how, how difficult having it easy sometimes can turn out to be. And it is a lesson that Murakami really manages to, to show in a persuasive way. Next up, in, in another day and a half, I also read Sputnik My Sweetheart, which was even closer to my own preference for uh, novelistic heroes, because while, while the protagonist is once more um, post-World War II 
generation Japanese man, or rather the point of view character is such a man. The actual uh, main character of the novel, the one around whom everything is is going on, is a woman who who is imbued by this this singular purpose to become a writer. However, she is quite incapable of returning to works that she has already begun. She has this amazing impetus to write, and she keeps doing it, but she finds herself incapable of finishing anything. She is another one of those figures who also are incapable of of becoming part of the collective. She is outside of society, attempting to live by her own rules, and the the big uh, conflict in the novel is born out of her falling in love with another woman, and for the sake of that love, attempting to to become part of the collective, attempting to live within society, whereas before she has always lived outside it. And that brings about a lot of issues for her. And of course, in addition to that, I, I have to mention the magical realism that is such an influential and key part of the DNA of Murakami's works. Magical realism in which people disappear without a trace, in which different, different, un, unspeakable or rather undescribable elements suddenly materialize only to disappear later with, without either question or providing any answers. Without either a question? That doesn't make much sense, does it? I mean that things happen in Murakami's novels, things which are, are devoid of reason. That is the difference between magical realism and fantasy, after all, right? Because in fantasy, you always have this explanation of the fantastic. While in magical realism, whatever happens that is out of this world, it, it doesn't... Um, demand explanation, it will, if, if you expect explanation, if you're looking for explanation, you will be sorely disappointed most of the time. But then again, explanation is not the purpose of it. What magical realism is uh, trying and attempting and succeeding at doing, more often than not, is um, showing human characters being human in in somehow sometimes in human conditions makes sense right i hope it does the last Haruki murakami book i read was the winder bird chronicles and that one took me so much longer than the previous two put together truthfully it is a much longer novel at 600 and uh, over 650 pages I recall, I think, whereas both uh, South of the Border and West of the Sun and Sputnik My Sweetheart are over or just about 200 pages, just barely over, I think, in the case of Sputnik My Sweetheart, I think that was 220, while South of the Border, West of the Sun was more like 180. So a lot more of a time commitment, The Winder Bird Chronicles. The other thing, the other part, and that it was, it was kind of more difficult to read. There is something of a reckoning in The Winder Bird Chronicles with Japan's imperial history and the history of all those horrors that the Japanese imperialist uh, and and warmongering um, government managed to to create during uh, the Second World War. There are some truly brutal scenes in the Winder Bird Chronicles which which portray violence like you would not believe. Scenes which make me even me, and I re I've read a lot of brutal stuff in my life. Scenes which made me queasy.
scenes which made me uh, turn off my Kindle and go for a walk. Those kinds of scenes. They're not the main point of The Wind of Bird Chronicles. They're, I would say, more of a B plot, if we should think in in the you know traditional TV show A plot B plot kind of um, viewpoint. What is the Wind of Bird Chronicles all about? In short, it is a man who loses his cat and then eventually loses his wife. It is about a man who makes an unexpected connection with a World War II veteran. It is about a man who has something of a gift to to help others. And of a woman who also has something of a similar gift. It is about two Japanese women who have the most curious and un-Japanese names you could imagine, Krita and Malta Kano. It is about all of these things, and yet about none of them. It is about men who, or rather one man, who is overtly ambitious, and one man who is his antithesis. It is a complicated book to talk about, and in it you will find everything that you would expect from Haruki Murakami. And a lot more, besides. I have great difficulty talking about it, because there is so much going on in that novel. If you would like to hear about it, let me know. And I will endeavor to prepare something far more interesting. The last piece of um, literary fiction was Philip Roth's Ghostwriter, which is a short book. I listened to the audio version of this one, and it was just over four hours long. This is a novel about about what it it means to be Jewish, in a way. It is a novel about the success of a young writer and the ability of of a writer to live in his own head, to imagine things that don't necessarily have much to do with the truth, or at any rate with reality. Whether reality and the truth have a lot in common is a question that I'm not capable of answering in this video. The Ghostwriter is about the meeting of a successful novelist with an incoming new ambitious uh, writer who, who has always admired this older... Um, the Jew who got away, I believe, was uh, our protagonist's description of of the writer in question. In Ghostwriter, our protagonist, Nathan Zuckerman, meets his literary hero, as I mentioned, E.I. Lonoff. And this meeting becomes something far more complex than at first appears. Zuckerman ends up being dragged into something of a, of a domestic circus which complicates his relationship first with his idol and then with with a young woman. The whole notion of Zuckerman living in his head, imagining things that are not naturally... The whole notion of Zuckerman living in his head, imagining things that are not necessarily true, comes from this meeting with what the novel's blurb describes as a dark-haired beauty. At the same time, there is an intertextual play with the journals of Anne Frank, which adds a delightful layer of historicity to uh, the ghostwriter, and one which which almost has the the taste of 
of uh, likelihood to it. Not not truthfulness necessarily, but a very convincing what if in the way that that wishful thinking can often convince you of things that not are not necessarily the way that life actually is. Cool book is all I'm saying. Very cool book. Next up, we've got a few works of non-fiction. The first of them is a very short collection of addresses that Kurt Vonnegut did in sending off uh, graduates into university graduates into the real world. It is called If This Isn't Nice, What Is? And it is perhaps two and a half hours of listening as an audiobook, which is how I consumed this particular one. Uh, consumed. I hate that word. Gives you all those notions of consumerism and consumers and... Anyway, the point is, if this isn't nice, what is? Such a fun collection. At no point does Kurt Vonnegut repeat himself during these collected addresses in in a way that that annoys or frustrates no what he does is he overall looks at the same several teams but in fresh and new ways and there is one particular anecdote from which the, the title of this collection comes into the fore, if this isn't nice, what is? Which Vonnegut returns to again and again during, I, I would say, about half the addresses that, that he gives to each and every one of those. I, I, I received this anecdote in ever so slightly different a way. The idea is you have to take a moment now and then to appreciate your life, even if you're having a bit of a hard time, but especially when you're not, stop for a moment and ask yourself, if this isn't nice, what is? It's good advice, I think. And it promotes a uh, kind of mindfulness that I can really get it, get into. Vonnegut has always been one of my favorite writers and Slaughterhouse Five is, I think, the second greatest anti-war novel ever written, the first being Cash 22. Vonnegut was a true visionary and uh, I truly wish he were he was still out there and creating. He would be about a hundred years old now. He passed away in 2007 or 2008, I think, at the age of 80-something, a very good age. And uh, I, think, I think we're all the poorer for not having his, his words of wisdom with us, reflecting more of the time. There is one aspect uh, in which his, his collection... His, one of his addresses was widely off the mark, I hope, in which he talks about um, keeping your kids away from uh, computer devices and how computer devices will basically turn you into, well, uh, not great folks, not folks you'd like to be around and certainly not folks who can contribute to society. I think vagabonds, idiots, and something of the like was used. I have the exact quote on my review in my blog, the link for which you will likely find down in the description. And if I may remind you that you press the like button and subscribe as we move on to our next two or even three works of nonfiction. I read Nemesis by Max Hastings, an excellent uh, historical account of the um, Japanese 
slash American front, uh, the Pacific front, pardon. And um, that was actually great preparation for uh, the Haruki Murakami book, The Wind Up Bird Chronicles, because it gave me so much knowledge, such a better idea of the conflict going on in uh, Manchuria, throughout China, um, in the Pacific. Just such a massive amount of fascinating information very, very lengthy book, but well worth reading. I also read two works of literary criticism. I actually read a few more, but two are particularly worth mentioning. One is Three Inquiries into Character by uh, Tony Morrill and Rita Felsky and Amanda... Uh, the name is here or here somewhere, I'm sure. The second, the second novel. These these essays, uh, very good, very good essays. If you're interested in literary criticism, the way they think about looking at characters in new ways, at examining characters critically, is invaluable for anyone who is planning on doing uh, English academia, English literature, or any other kind of academic literary. Um, critical critical work. The second book, also by Rita Felsky, The Limits of Critique, which expands on this idea that there are certain ways of doing literary criticism that are dominant and that are dominant for no good reason. These ways are diminishing our capacity to do interesting things in an academic context. They are furthermore uh, weakening interest in the humanities and, and are creating a rift between the way in which um, professional critics and uh, the laymen who read literature take up literature, consume literature, enjoy literature, and think about literature. And Ritvelsky's project, the one she proposes in The Limits of Critique, is meant to bridge this gap and to breathe life once more into uh, interest in the humanities, to redefine and clarify the role that the humanities have in our lives. Huh. I think I managed to uh, vocalize all of this pretty well. Ritavalsky's novel... Uh, novel. I had to screw it up. This critical work, well worth reading, whether you're an academic or someone else interested, interested in the world of critical analysis. That much for nonfiction. This last point of our discussion has everything to do with science fiction and fantasy. The best book I read during my time away was The Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynne. Mr. Gwynne, the father of my lovely friends at the Brothers Gwynne Channel, uh, Will and Ed, is, is a phenomenal fantasy author, one that I had not read until I picked up Shadow of the Gods, and one that I am now certain to read everything else by. Shadow of the Gods recreates in a way that, if, if not the content, certainly not, then the feeling of a Norse epic and it does so in, in the best ways possible. The world of Shadow of the Gods is gritty and dark and full of monsters. It is not at all hospitable to human life. It is hostile. But at the same time, civilization is inextricably moving forward. In it, we have a trio of really excellent characters, all of them 
defined and motivated by what I think you will find really relatable, relatable motivations. And yes, I know I kind of repeat myself by using motivated and motivations, but eh, doesn't matter. I'm not going to talk about Shadow of the Gods a lot here. I very much plan on maybe rereading it by the end of the year and and involving myself with it a lot more at a lot higher level of discourse. I think it is well worth that discussion. What I will leave you with is this idea that it truly is something something of an exceptional release and definitely one of the high points of uh, the fantasy genre for 2021. Two other books I read in the SFF genre. One of them was The War of the Worlds. In fact, I listened to this one as narrated by David Tennant. Uh, a fun experience in itself, just to listen to. I can see a lot of how The War of the Worlds has, has left its marks on the popular psyche, on, on science fiction, certainly, but also on the way, perhaps, in which we write today's bestsellers. There was so much that I, I could just point out in that novel as a prototype of, of conventions which are still widely in use and, and very popular to this day. And I have to respect that. It's perhaps not as effective, as affecting, as it would be, uh, it would have been, rather, 50 years, certainly 100 years ago. But that doesn't take away from, from this colossal work, a foundational piece of the genre. I enjoyed it. Didn't love it but I appreciate it for the importance it has. One last book that I will bring to your attention, and this one I will just mention in the barest of terms because I beta read it, so it wasn't necessarily a final version of the book. And this is The Return of the Well Fleet by my good friend Benedict Patrick, author of the excellent um, folklore-based Jan's World novels. The Return of the Well Fleet sees uh, the return of a beloved character of, of mine, someone who starred in the Dark Star Dragon novel, the first of a new series Benedict has been working on. It is fun, adventurous, uh, portal, uh, world hoppity hoppity, and an overall exciting, exciting read. The Return of the Well Fleet, however, at one point does shift from, from the tone that I expected and adored into something unexpected, a lot darker, a lot more um, effed up. I'm going to say, just so I don't offend the YouTube gods. It's not like I need that as well. It's good. It's good. I, I look forward to getting the final version. I kickstarted it some months ago when Benedict had a, a campaign for that. He's a friend of mine, so I'm very much biased towards looking kind of... Um, you know, hoping he is successful with the release of this one and looking favorably upon him is what I was trying to say. But that that is something to look forward to in a few months' time. I think, in fact, this video has gone on very, very long. Long enough, certainly. So I will now leave you to it. With, with one last uh, word of, 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 I suppose, wisdom, and that word is subscribe.
please, I'm desperate. I really need this child to grow so I do not one day starve as a starving literary graduate, which I'm, I'm currently on the way of becoming. I did graduate my, uh, my underground degree. I got that. That was fun. But um, uh, video ending, yes. Thank you for watching, friends. That's how you do it, yes. Thank you for watching. Like and share this video with your friends. I don't know why you would like that. It's been just bragging, bragging, bragging and uh, a very much stream of consciousness kind of thing going on lately in this channel. And by lately, I mean over the last half an hour or so. But I did enjoy doing this. I think it's been a while, so I needed to get this whole um, just just messy video out of the way so I can go back to doing better structured content. There's some video games content incoming as well, so look forward to that. Maybe I'll do it on a new channel, however, I haven't yet decided thinking about it. And with that I leave you, I bid you adieu, friends. Goodbye, goodbye, I've missed you, you've missed me too. Now tell me what you would like to hear about in the comments down below. Any of these books, any other books? Yes, goodbye. Bye. Yes, goodbye. No, no, no. You go. Please. Um, leave me. Leave me alone, please. I have had enough of this.